Good morning. My name is uh, Ben Wheeler, and I will be doing our scripture reading today. We will be reading Matthew uh, 5, 21 through 26. And if you don't have your Bible with you, it will be up on the screen for you all to follow along. You've heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be sub subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who's angry with a brother or sister will be subject, subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there, remember that your brother or sister has something against you. Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. Thank you, Ben. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Redeemer. Glad that you guys are here. Uh, my name is Cody Carroll, and I'm super, super grateful to, to be with you guys. I serve on the college staff uh, with the college ministry. Love my job, love what I get to do. And I'm super, super glad that you guys are here. And so we're thankful that you're here. We're thankful that you've woke up, you know, drove through the puddles, get, you know, done everything that you needed to do to get here. We're grateful for it. Um, and happy Memorial Day weekend. We are thankful for those who have laid down their lives for the freedoms and the liberties that we get to enjoy as a country, as a nation. So we're grateful. So this, this morning, we are continuing our summer sermon series talking about the most famous sermon of all time, and that is the Sermon on the Mount. We're talking about the Sermon on the Mount. So last week, Dusty talked about what it means for us as followers of Jesus to live as salt and light in our world, to live as different folks. And starting this week, and really over the next few weeks, Jesus is going to be addressing several different topics Topics like anger, which we're going to talk about today, so that'll be a great time. Uh, we're going to talk about lust, relationships, all these things are coming in the coming weeks, but today we're talking about anger, so it's going to be great. Jesus begins at, at the Sermon on the Mount, on the side of this hill, he begins each of these topical addresses by saying, you have heard it said. He says, you have heard it said, and what he's doing is he is referring to the religious teachings of the time. So if you can imagine it, Jesus sitting on the side of this hill overlooking the lake of Gennesaret, teaching to a crowd of people from all backgrounds. You've got Pharisees, you know, super religious people, religious elite, cultural Jews, you know, they're just there, non-religious Jews, non-religious people, other religions. You've got everybody sitting there listening to Jesus' teachings in a generally religious society. So it would have gone something like this. Hey, you guys, all of y'all, you've heard it said to walk properly with God means that you need to do this and don't do this. Do this and don't do this. This is exactly what the religious teachers would have been teaching at the time. So in context to anger, our topic today, it would have gone something like this. Hey, you guys, you've heard it said, don't kill anybody and you're good. Don't kill anybody and you're good. Live a long, happy life Way to go, fist bump, God, check, boom, crushing it. Move on. This was, this was common thought and practice of the day. And so the problem is that these teachings, they're, they're not necessarily wrong. Like don't murder, you know, a great command. But it's more than that. It's about more than that. They're not necessarily wrong. These teachings are just incomplete. And so with these statements, Jesus begins to get to the heart and the root of our struggle with Anger, And so we may live in a very different time, an altogether different world from these folks that are sitting on this hill, you know, 2,000 years ago. But we as a society are likely more angry than they were. We, we are likely more angry than the crowd that Jesus is talking to on the side of that hill. So how much more might we need to listen to what Jesus has to say on anger? So we can read passages like this and think, man, I haven't killed anybody. I don't scream or yell at my kids or family or whoever, you know, like that much. You know, I don't intimidate my spouse. I don't rage on my coworkers. You know, people don't like hate me. I'm good. Like, you know, let's, 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 let's talk about something else. But Jesus, Jesus takes it deeper. He takes us deeper into what it truly means to walk with God concerning our anger. And what we'll see especially for myself, is that no one makes it out of this passage alive. Jesus has something to say to each of us this morning. So with that being said, 
Matthew 5, 21 through 22, and this will be up on the screen. You have heard that it was said to those of old. Again, you have heard. You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you, it's Jesus saying this, but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. And so what we see within this passage is that Jesus begins to address both the actions and the hearts of the people in the crowd. You've heard it said, don't murder. Murder is a sin. This is a great commandment, one of my personal favorites. And this is certainly that the Pharisees would have been teaching about at the time. But Jesus, he takes it a step further. He says, if you are so much as angry with a brother or sister, you are liable to judgment. So Jesus is correcting the incomplete teachings of the day that says, so long as you don't murder anybody, you're good to go, concerning this command, like you did it. Way to go, gold star, crushing it. So before going any further, I want to define anger. So in my mind, um, which is not impressive, in my mind, there are generally two broad categories for talking about anger. This is not like from research, this is not a study, this is me, regular guy, just living life, making observations. First kind of anger is this. I would describe it as aggressive anger. Aggressive anger. And this looks like pretty much exactly what you would imagine. Could be yelling, could be screaming, could be physical abuse, could be emotional abuse. This type of anger is certainly present within this text. Murder is an aggressive, response-based, rage-based form of anger, okay? And according to Christ, we should not murder. Pretty clear. Maybe, but maybe you haven't murdered anyone, but maybe you are in here and this type of anger is a part of your story, either as the angry person or the undeserving recipient. Past or present, and these things grieve God. They do. And if you're in here and you yourself, like find yourself getting angry and letting that anger turn into rage, leading you to lash out on those closest to you, the call for you is simple. It's to stop. It's to get help. It is to talk to someone and to begin the long process of pursuing health and safety for those around you and for yourself. And if you're in a situation where you are the recipient of this type of anger, please share that with someone. Please come and talk to one of the pastors here, seek out help and safety. So that's the first kind of anger. The second kind of anger, which is we're going to be spending the the majority of our time and attention on today, could be described as like a general, low-grade, just frustration with life and just how things are playing out. Oftentimes, at least in my own life, this low-level hum of frustration is typically what actually boils up into anger. Okay, so for me, I'll speak for myself, for me, this type of deep-seated frustration stems from a plethora of misplaced expectations, typically revolving around my hope for an easy life, my hope for an easy life. In other words, I get frustrated when life is harder than I feel like it should be. So let me explain. So this week, this is a crazy week. My kids did not have school. They go to a PDO, and so every so often, they shut down for about a week, not my favorite thing, you know, just not, not the best. Uh, my wife and I, we both work full-time jobs. So what that looks like for us is um, one of us will get up, we'll try by God's grace to get up early, like early, early, like five or 6 a.m., get into work, work at their actual jobs for the morning shift, and then, you know, we'll like tag in, tag out over lunch, and then the other one gets to go into work for the latter half of the day. That's how it goes down in our house. So on Tuesday, I go into work up at the offices, I'm at work, working on this sermon, you know, having a great time. I'm about to go to get in my car to leave, and my wife calls me, and she says, hey, uh, I'm going to kill Sully. (laughs) Sully is not one of our kids. Let's just clarify that. Though that's not like, you know, that far of a stretch. Just kidding. Um, Sully, he is our golden doodle. He's great, except for in this moment. Um, I'm like, what is going on? I normally don't get phone calls like this from my wife. She says, Sully has, let's just say, to keep it G, he has had accidents on everything, all over the house, everything, including himself, which is, that's the best part. And she says, hey, I've tried to clean it up. You're on your way home. I have a meeting that I need to get ready for. Um, So he's outside, and I need you to deal with it when you get home. And so I'm like on the back of like an awesome morning, you know, like you're just like crushing it. Like, oh, this is great, you know. And and then I get this phone call, and I'm like, okay, (laughs) 
Like, what am I about to walk into? You know, like, like is, the, is the house okay? And I begin to feel this like deep-rooted frustration, anger, I would call it, begin to boil up inside of me. So I get home, the dog is outside who, by the way, is not an outside dog. So he's like generally not outside for more than like two seconds. Cassie's like, hey, I gotta go. Our two kids are like covered in their lunches and I'm just like staying there like, okay, like this is life. This is where we're at. And so, um, so all of that being said, the golden doodle is trying to break through the door. Um, he's covered in himself and, it, and I, I boil up into anger. Like, like, I, like I just get frustrated. I turn into like major pain, start, you know, shouting orders like do this, don't do this. Kids like, you know, wrap it up, clean yourselves, get in, you know, go get in your sleep sack, all the good stuff. And I remember like having this thought and I haven't even like addressed the dog yet. He's still just outside ruining my life. Um, <laughs> I'm having these thoughts of like, why, why is it so difficult? Like, why is life so hard? Why can't things be easier? And so for me, this type of anger, like this actual like frustration boils up from a place of deep frustration when, it, when life just doesn't go exactly how I think it should go. So granted, situation in the kitchen with my dog, frustrating for sure, like for sure frustrating, mostly gross though. But in the grand scheme of things, like it's really not that big of a deal. It's just not. But because there is in myself this low level hum of frustration that so oftentimes lives in my heart, these small inconveniences of life turn into something that just much bigger than they should be. They turn into something much bigger than they should be. So if I'm being honest, like this type of anger and frustration oftentimes comes around my desire to just have an easier life. To just, I just think that life should be easier than it should. And so after kind of like thinking about, okay, like that's super entitled, Cody. Why is that, why do you think that should be true? So in my own life, I have come to realize, honestly, over this past week, is that I live a very uninterruptible life. I live a very uninterruptible life. I'm an uninterruptible person, not a fun realization to make. What I mean by this is that life is great. Like life is great when life goes exactly how my Google calendar says it should go. And my kids, who are two and one, behave exactly how I ask them to behave. When work goes exactly how I think it should go, or when my relationship with my spouse is perfect. Like anything short of the level of ease and comfort that I think my life should be marked by leads me to a place of really deep frustrations because I do not allow the natural interruptions of life to just be what they are. I make them into something much more bigger than they should be. So this is like the primary way in which God has worked on me through this text this week. But both the aggressive type of anger, the first one, and the second, you know, just low level hum of frustration that we feel with life, both of these, both of these types of anger lead us towards sin, primarily because in our sin, in our anger, in our frustration, we tend to take that out on other people. We, we do, we tend to take it out on other people. So quick disclaimer about righteous anger, that's a fun one. You might be thinking, didn't Jesus get angry? Like, you know, like, hold on, like I hear what you're saying, but like, di didn't Jesus get angry? Yes, like a few chapters later in Matthew, he flips tables in the temple, like driving people out, which I'm like, I, I have in my mind what I feel like that is gonna look like, but it, and it's certainly not, you know, gentle, you know, petting a lamb. It's like, no, he's mad, like he is mad. Um, and yes, the answer to that question, yes, it is anger. Christ is exhibiting in that story what is referred to as righteous anger. Okay, this is not a Jesus juke. I mean, it kind of is, but it is not a Jesus juke. Righteous anger is a real thing because anger as an emotion is not inherently sinful. Anger as an emotion is not inherently sinful. When we open up the news and we hear about another school shooting, when we get that text from a friend about a heartbreaking diagnosis, like we get angry. I get angry, you guys might not, I do. Primarily for me, I believe that, like I get angry because it feels like something like deep inside of me knows that this is just not how it should be. It's just not how life should be. It's how life is, but it's just not how it should be. By God's grace, we do not grieve as those without hope, but we still experience all of what it means to live life in a broken world. And that includes anger. But, but because of our sin, because of our sin, our anger is almost never righteous. My anger is almost certainly never righteous. When I lose my mind on my dog for, you know, it's probably my fault for not letting him out, you know, 
like, that's not righteous anger. It's just anger. Or when I'm frustrated with my toddler because he wants at 4 a.m. a pair of matching socks so he'll go back to sleep, like, that's not righteous anger. Like, I'm just mad. I'm just frustrated. I'm just frustrated. Righteous anger is a thing, but it's typically not my thing. And the good news is that Jesus wants to show us how to put away anger, to put it away, not just control its expressions. Okay, so as best as I can read this passage, I believe that Jesus is giving his disciples and us today two kind of responses, two implications to make in light of these verses. Okay, so let's pick back up in Matthew 5, 23 through 26, which says this. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Okay, point number one, how to deal with anger Be reconciled to others. This is gonna be up on the screen. Be reconciled to others. So present within this passage is our reconciliation with others in light of our anger. Reconciliation, just a fancy word of describing the restoration of harmony within a relationship. The restoration of harmony within a relationship. So again, if you can imagine it, Jesus talking to this crowd on the side of the hill, overlooking this lake, doing his thing, And he has just dropped a bomb on them saying, hey, you have heard it said, you've heard it said, just don't murder and you're good. But I'm telling you, if you are so much as angry with another person, you are in sin, which, you know, would have almost certainly condemned everyone on the side of the hill. So they're like, you know, reeling from that. Jesus is saying that anger, anger and the conflict that comes with it is present in this text. And Jesus, by his grace, shows us exactly what we are to do. Go and be reconciled. So what this text is saying is that if you know that someone is upset with you or you're upset with someone else, and so far as the environment is safe and so far as it depends on you, Jesus is saying, hey, go and sort that out. Jesus is telling you to go and make it right. Be reconciled, be restored. This doesn't mean that you have to be best friends with this person, but it does mean that there needs to be a a restoration of a level of harmony, harmony. So Jesus takes it even further than this. He says that if you are worshiping God, like modern day equivalent of like right now worshiping, if you are worshiping God and remember that someone has something against you, first go and be reconciled to that person before worshiping God. Not after, not after lunch, before worshiping God. This is a big deal because if you study the scriptures, you see that like God is like about his worship. So When Jesus, who's God, by the way, says to hit pause on our worship to go and make right with someone who you know you're striving with, like this is a big deal. This is a big deal. A real life example from my life this week, I kind of came into this week thinking like, I'm not like super angry, you know, like I'm not an angry person, just kind of living life, you know, doing great. Um, And then I, you know, prepared the sermon. I was like, oh, ooh, like I'm actually like, like God is doing some, some pretty big things in my heart in light of this text. And so for me, this may sound silly to you, okay? So, but as I was writing the sermon, I felt like God was asking me to apologize to my son, to apologize to my son for being generally short, frustrated, you know, unengaged, impatient this past week. And I can think of, as a you know, good dad, a thousand reasons why that frustration was justified, why the dad voice, you know, was well deserved you know, clear commands, all that stuff is good. Like I, I thought of a thousand reasons why I could get out and get away from apologizing to my son. But in reality, I was just being unkind. I was just being impatient. I had sinned against my son. Now, Gray, as a two-year-old, he's sitting there and I'm apologizing to him. I'm like, hey, buddy, I'm so sorry. Like the, the only thing he says is like, dad, where's Lightning McQueen? I'm like, I'm like okay. I'm like, I'm like, okay, I'm glad. I'm like, it's not about you, bud. I'm just doing this because this is what God's asking, you know. Uh, but, but regardless of his quickness to forgive, like Gray, my son, this past week was on the undeserving end of my frustration and anger. And I felt like God, in light of this text, was asking me to go and to be reconciled with him. Like, like our application is pretty clear here. And all that's great. 
that's great, but what if it's not with your son who only cares about Lightning McQueen? What if, you know, you're in some beef with somebody else and you go and you try to be reconciled to them you know that some sort of wrong has occurred, whether it's your fault or theirs. You go and you're trying to make it right. And they're like, hey, I don't want anything to do with you. Like they're not texting you back. They're not ready to talk. They're not ready to come to the table. What do you do then in light of this text? So I don't think that what this passage is saying is that like your whole life should grind to a halt until this person texts you back. I just don't think that that's the case. What this verse is saying is to pursue reconciliation so much as it depends on you. So much as it depends on you, go and be restored. We are only responsible for ourselves and for our walks with God. So if you feel like God is asking you to do something, you should do it. Do it so far as God would open the doors to allow reconciliation to happen. Okay, we pursue reconciliation and we leave the rest to God. Okay, point number two. Point number one, be reconciled to others. Point number two, be reconciled to God. So embedded within this passage is the reconciliation or the restoration of harmony between God and man, between God and man. So at creation, God created humanity in his image to live in perfect harmony with him. But because of sin, we can no longer live in in the perfect presence and harmony and peace with God. Each of us at our core desires to fix the brokenness that we feel day in and day out, day in and day out, but we can't, we cannot. We cannot fix as humanity what is most wrong with us. We cannot bridge our way back to God. We cannot fix our sin. But God, in his grace, he sent Jesus. Jesus would live the perfect life that we should have lived, minister to folks all over modern day Israel, preach the Sermon on the Mount so as to show us, undeserving humanity, what it was like to love God and to love others. He would be wrongfully crucified, condemned, beaten, mocked, killed, And after being dead for three days, God would raise Christ from the grave, defeating sin and death and all of the separation for all of those who believe in Jesus. And so our reconciliation with God is implied in this passage. And our reconciliation with God through Christ, it's how we are made right with God, not by simply doing X, Y, or Z, okay? Furthermore, in the context of our passage today, in context of anger, like our salvation is not secured on the back of how well we control our anger and frustration. So before I came to faith in Jesus, this is exactly what I thought. I did not grow up in church at all. Went to church maybe one time before I was 16. Um, that's, you know, that's great. Love that. Not want that for, do not want that for my kids. But before I came to Christ, this is exactly what I thought God, God wanted from me. Do this, don't do this. Do this, don't do this. Long story short, to spare you guys the details, my life before Jesus was filled with like episode after episode of just doing everything that I thought was supposed to make me happy. Everything, everything. And at the end of a particularly dark season, I had decided that I needed to go to church because I wanted to learn about God. No, not at all. Um, I, I went to church because I thought that's what I was supposed to do as a good, you know, Southern boy. I wanted to make God happy. I had heard it said, whether it was from others or from myself, that in one way or another, like going to church, doing the thing, becoming morally right, like whatever that even means, not smoking, not drinking, not having any fun, getting my attitude in check, doing all of these things would mean that God is happy with me. And if he's happy with me, maybe I'll live and lead a happy life. Praise God that that is not how he works. So on one of my first nights ever, like legit, first nights ever in church, I was, a, I was at youth, shout out youth ministry, holla, parents, keep it up, keep bringing your kids. I stepped foot into this cheesy youth room, First Baptist Church of Corinth, and I heard the gospel from a, from a faithful youth pastor in a cheesy youth room. Y'all, this room, I did not grow up in church. Apparently this is normal. It was not normal for me. It was dark, like real dark. It was like mist and haze. I was like, is it always like this? Like, oh, I can't see it was road sign themed, you know? Like, it's like yield, yield to Jesus. And you're like, I'm like, I walk in, I'm like, I hate it here. I was like, I have to go. Um, I was also the new kid. And so if you grew up in church, there's a new kid. It was like the like adults were like, you know, drooling. Like, oh gosh, you're here. You know, let me talk to you. And so like, like everything felt so strange. Everything felt so, 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 so strange. But God saved me that night. God saved me that night in 2012. I heard the truth of scripture that says that God is after more than whether or not I do X, Y, or Z, whether or not I get my attitude together, whether or not I get my anger under control. 
that God saved me because of what Jesus did, not for what I could do for myself. And it changed my life. I'd never heard that before. God didn't save me after I got my act together, but he saved me in the midst of my sin and my moody, angry teenager self. Like he saved me in the midst of that, not after I became better, whatever that even means. So yes, Christ did die to reconcile us, me, you, back to the Father to secure everlasting life at his side. Praise God for that. But Jesus also gives us a way to deal with our anger. He gives us a way to deal with our anger. How? By giving our anger to him, by giving our anger and our frustration to Jesus. So this is gonna be up on the screen. It's one of my favorite verses in all of the Bible, Ezekiel 36, 26 through 27, which says this. And I, this is God, this is God's word, this is what God is saying. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and I will cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. So Jesus, God, helps us to deal with our anger, with our frustration, with all that comes with that primarily by giving us, by giving believers a new heart and a new spirit and inviting us to give him our anger and our frustration. So before Christ and apart from like sheer self-determination, we have no ability to change ourselves. We have no ability to deal with everything that lives inside of us. Self-help truly is our best shot, um, but, but Christ can do more in our hearts in a split second than a lifetime of reading self-help books and trying to white knuckle your way into being a better person. Jesus can do more in your life. We can change because Jesus can change us. Truly, we can change because Jesus can change us. We can deal with the anger, with the sin that lives within us because Christ has dealt with it. Because Christ has dealt with our sin. He has defeated sin and death. This is true of our anger. This is true of our lust. This is true of our relational strife, our jealousy, everything in between. Like we can change because God can change us. When we get hot, when we get frustrated, when we feel ourselves getting mad, tempted, drifting towards sin, drawing away from others, whatever anger and frustration looks like, for you, however it plays itself out in your life, when we draw near to God in those moments, in those moments, not when everything is going great, but when we draw near to God, when things are hard, like God does something in us. He does something in us. When we draw near to him, when we trust him with what's going on, when we share what is going on, why we're frustrated, why we're angry, like God does things in our hearts in those moments. So in my life, um, I know this to be true. Typically for me, um, anger plays itself out more in the like, hey, just generally frustrated, and that kind of boils up into, you know, me sinning against everyone, basically. So in those moments, as a follower of Jesus, like in those moments where I can feel myself drifting towards anger, drifting towards frustration, Jesus is inviting me in that moment to give my frustration, my anger to him. I'm not gonna prescribe what this could look like for you. I'll tell you what this looks like for me. I'm very simple, you know? So you are like, oh, wow, this is groundbreaking. It's really not. What this looks like for me, you know, I need a minute. I need a minute, you know, mindfulness. Shout out Apple Watch, thanks for that. I need to take a minute. I go and I take a fake bathroom break, okay? Take a fake, ba- it's real, it's real life. Take, taking lots of these this week. Take a fake bathroom break, get away, even if it's just for 30 seconds. 30 seconds, a minute, whatever it is. Confess the frustrations that are going on in my heart and in my mind in that moment. Confess these things to God. Ask for God's grace ask for God's forgiveness, ask for God to change me. It's a key point here. God, change me. I know I shouldn't be feeling this. I know I shouldn't be acting this way. God, help me. Ask to walk in the fruit of the spirit, fake, wash my hands, you know, and enter back into the world. It's a constant struggle. Like like I've said this throughout my time, is that like, this has been a hard week for me. Like, I don't know if it's because I'm preparing a sermon on anger, but I'm like, this has been a hard week. I feel like I need extra servings of God's grace. But he has transformed me and he will continue to do so. And the reality though of all of this is that Jesus wants to change us. He wants to change you. He wants to change me far more than we want to change ourselves. That's the reality. Jesus wants to show us how to walk in a way that makes our life look like it's marked by joy, by peace, by patience, by kindness, not by a low level hum of frustration and certainly not in fits of anger. By his grace, Jesus has done a powerful work in me and I bet 
he will do it for you. So as we wrap up, as we begin to land the plane, follower of Jesus, follower of Christ, if you have been walking with God for any length of time, you know that God wants to change you. You know that God wants to transform you to look more like Jesus. So what would it look like for you in this moment to draw near to him, to confess what's going on? What is obedience? Furthermore, what does obedience look like for you this morning? Do you need to reconcile with someone in this room? Like you haven't went to the bathroom because you're like, I gotta walk past them, you know? You can laugh, that's okay, guys. Do you need to reconcile with someone in this room, outside of this room? If you feel that prick in your spirit, I think you should take that seriously. According to this text, your worship, it depends on it. So to the person who isn't quite sure where they stand with God, what would it look like for you to pray to God for maybe the first time? To tell God what's going on in your life, to confess your frustrations, your struggles, your doubts, all of these things. What if God is real and what if he really cares about you? So if you've yet to place your faith in Jesus, what is holding you back? Has self-help and has trying to just become a better person, what does that even mean? Like has your pursuit of these things really enacted the like deep heart level change that you're going for? Like has it accomplished what you'd hoped it would? Maybe you, maybe you were like me. Maybe you had heard it said that you could only receive love from God if you just do this or that, or just don't do this or that. But God, in his grace, through scripture, through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, he says that he loves you. He says that he wants a relationship with you. He says he wants to make you new. He wants to give you a new heart and a new spirit and make you a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Like this is what God has said, all because of what Jesus has done, not because of what you can do for yourself. So to conclude, our reconciliation with God is our primary means as followers of Jesus to deal with the anger and the frustration that we feel in this life. Jesus wants to take you to the deepest places of your heart. He wants to change you. He wants to make you look more like Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we're just so grateful. So grateful for you this morning, grateful for your grace, thankful for all of the ways in which you um, are working in us. God, I pray um, for those in here who feel that prick in their spirit, that you feel like you are asking them to do something. God, that you would give boldness, you would give courage, you would give conviction to enter in, to engage in the ways that you are calling them to engage. God, I pray that you would be with all of us as we seek to not just control the expressions of our anger and frustration, but I pray that you would help us to get to the root of it. Lord, we love you. Jesus, we thank you. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen.